Welcome to C-SPAN Book TV's After Words program. Uh, my name's Christopher Hitchens, and I'm here in the, for me, unaccustomed role of inter interviewer and uh, producer um, of my friend and colleague, George Packer, who's produced two volumes of the essays of George Orwell, appropriately picked and introduced and commented upon. And so today, <clears throat> Orwell is our subject. Um, so I, I wish we had more than an hour. Um, you've, I, I'm guessing that you will have read D.J. Taylor's book on George Orwell. I haven't. No. Oh, what a shame. But it doesn't matter, because what I wanted to say from his um, book was something that I have a feeling you'll agree with. Taylor writes at one point, says, when I read other people writing about George Orwell, I keep thinking, hey, this is my author you're yeah, talking about. Yeah. Do you ever get that feeling? Um, I do, and um, it, we all have a, you, know, you and I, and a few other people we know and some we don't know are part of a, a, a really fanatical group of Orwell lovers, and it's very personal. And uh, I started reading Orwell uh, maybe a little late. It was in my early 20s, but it was at a critical moment when I needed uh, a kind of a model. I needed to know how does one become a writer. And so I just read straight through what was then the only um, collection of Orwell's essays in journalism, the four volumes, uh, collected essays, journalism, and letters, and just read straight through. It was like reading a, an autobiography. Um, and and felt, you felt yourself being personally addressed. I felt very close to the voice mm. of those pieces. And I think those are where you get closest to Orwell, uh, to his voice, to what's essential, to his really what in his character is um, strong and worth emulating. And I became a slavish emulator and imitator for a while in my 20s. I think it's a good way to learn how to write, just to find a writer you feel some affinity for and just master their prose style, their rhythms. You get get the, 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 the cadences into your own nerve system and, and then try to find your own way into it. But that's the closeness Orwell produces in people like me and you. And so, yeah, we feel a little bit proprietary uh, when we read other people um, write, writing about him, too. But not when those people get him right. And I think your book, Why Orwell Matters, gets him right. You said in that book, Orwell got the three basic questions of the 20th century right, imperialism, fascism, and communism. And that's, um, that sums up his political and literary achievement as well as any single appraisal. I always feel they derived from each other. In other words, from what he saw about imperialism, especially the sort of sexual repression and racism that it involved, I think he found it quite easy to decode the appeal of fascism and, th and the danger of it. It was to some extent an extension of imperialism, not purely, but to a good deal. Yeah. Uh, um, to a good deal. In, in, in many ways, that was the case. And then because it's funny, he hardly writes anything about fascism. He seems to just assume everyone will know that it's evil and needs to be fought against. That's There's right. almost nothing strange. There's almost no analysis of it. Um, he takes it for granted that, that, that it's uh, completely unacceptable. But it's in the course of fighting against one kind of totalitarianism that he discovers that there are many people claiming to be his allies who are not. Yes. And that actually there's, there's, a, there's a, an almost equally dangerous illusion taking place on the other side of the Urals. That's right. And he turned uh, the same you know, withering uh, scrutiny on his own side that he had turned in on a much easier target, Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, um, Franco Spain. And that was when he made most of his enemies uh, on the left and all the way to the end of his life. Yeah. Now, I realize I haven't said quite enough about you. I should perhaps have said some of this at the beginning, but um, for those of you who don't know him already or know his work, uh, Mr. Packer, well, first came to my attention, actually, as a novelist, uh, writing from Africa, um, in fact. And like Orwell, um, was capable of fiction, um, very enviably, as well as of uh, the essay, the long essay form by which I would think you're now probably reaching a large audience, Mr. Packer's work, especially from Iraq um, and other parts of the world, but especially from Iraq in The New Yorker, has got him a great of attention, and I believe you now have a collection of essays of your own. I do. A new book out called Interesting Times, Writings from a Turbulent Decade. But back to fiction. Yes. Um, you probably overpraised me there. I did write two novels. Um, they were read by about 35 people, 
And although I learned a lot from writing them, I did not learn to be a novelist, I don't think. Um, Orwell wrote uh, a batch of novels in the 1930s that were in the tradition of um, Anglo-American realism. And I love them. I, I don't know how you feel about them, but for me, Keep the Aspidistra Flying uh, is, is uh, just a marvelous book. Burmese Days is the one that really lasts the longest. But you just don't feel that Orwell's working in his most natural grain in those novels. You feel the essayist sort of pushing through the, yes. uh, the, the illusion <clears throat> of fiction all the time. He has something to say. He has an argument to make. He has something, you know, a proposition about the world all the time. And he doesn't have the restraint and patience of a natural fiction writer. And that's why we can be grateful that you know, he once wrote in, um, I think, in Why I Write, that if he'd been left to his own devices, he would have been a kind of 19th century British novelist yeah. like his heroes Dickens and Gissing. But events and the turbulence of the 30s and 40s pushed him into becoming what he called a kind of pamphleteer. The speed of the pamphleteer yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, and By that, the way, I, should, I have right. to interrupt because it's one of the very few completely unconvincing things I think he ever Absolutely. read. Absolutely. I was just going to say that because really it was not events that pushed him in that direction, it was his own inclination. Yes. Um, his f also, it's yeah. a very rare case of him being too conceited. In other words, he said, if it wasn't for all these polemics I have to write, I could have been Charles Dickens. Well, come on, you know, I mean, yeah. that's a bit yeah. much. Um, the Burmese say, was a saying in Burma that he flattered them by writing three novels about their country. Burmese days, yeah. Animal Farm in right. 1984. Right. I actually heard that line um, in Burma um, last year when, when I went there. Did you? Oh, yes, Orwell is still a huge presence in Burma, all the more... I think now there's an, a young generation who did not learn English well growing up. They came after the generation that was schooled by the British. They've, been, they've had their futures utterly blighted by the totalitarian regime there. And Orwell speaks to them not just because he wrote about Burma, but as you say, because he wrote about totalitarianism. 1984 has so many echoes in Burma today. And so you can actually find Animal Farm being sold discreetly uh, in bookstalls on the streets of, of Rangoon. And so he's a kind of, he's, he's re-emerged as a hero to these younger Burmese writers after being condemned for his supposed imperialism by the, the, the junta. And Burma. while we're on contemporary totalitarianism, which we might as well yeah. stay with for a bit, um, I've been in North Korea. And you know, when one goes as a reporter, one hopes to avoid cliche. And so I thought, I'm going to try not to mention 1984. <laughs> Because everyone says it's an Orwellian stage. It's yeah. a funny use of the word Orwellian. Yeah. But in fact, the great thing about totalitarianism is that it is a cliche. Um, it seems it to do you. the same thing over and over you, again. Kim Il-sung founded the North Korean state the same year that, that 1984 came out, I right. think. And it's as if someone gave him the novel in Korean and said, do you think we could make this work? And he right. thinks, well, I don't know, but we'll sure give it our best shot. It's, it's absolutely remarkable. Life and, imitated art. Yes, yeah. and I, it's the same. When people in countries like this come across Orwell, as the North Koreans one day will, they're amazed. I think the greatest compliment perhaps ever paid to one writer by another in the 20th century was by Shazwav Miwash when he, in The Captive Mind, when he wrote um, about the situation in Stalinist Poland. He said, there is a book in circulation. It's called 1984. It's, you can only get it privately. <clears throat> it's circulated with great secrecy and fear it, among the inner party. And he said, I personally was very surprised, as we all were, to find out he'd never visited the Soviet Union. Because how could he get how the texture? Yeah. How, how could he get the texture of it all so right without having had this experience? Now, yeah. Remember, 1984 is about the circulation of an illegal book within the inner party, exactly. among other about things. Goldstein. So it's, it's extraordinary. But that is a great question. How did Orwell know? He lived almost his entire life in England. He um, traveled a bit through Europe at the end of World War II. He had his years in Burma. But other than that, he was very parochial. He was confined to the island. And, and yet he wrote in um, his essay on Arthur Kessler, that the British writers of his generation had failed to understand totalitarianism because they had not lived it the way Kessler, Salone, Camus, and other continental writers had. And so he was sort of criticizing the, you know, what he called the parlor Bolsheviks, uh, Auden, Spender, yes. etc., for not feeling what it is <clears throat> to live under that kind of regime. Orwell felt it, but he had the same, other than his years in Burma and his 
suffering and hard times in the 30s, which they did not have. He had the same education and, and lived in the same England that they did, and yet he did feel it. And that's a, it's a bit of a mystery how he could have known it so well. well I